Hey everyone, Felix here. Welcome back to InventBox, where the solution is right around the corner. In this video, I want to teach you about the different types of memory that we have in our tool belt as we're developing for the FPGA. So in the past, when we've needed to save some information, we've, cura we've created a register and given it a certain width, like maybe 16 bits wide, and then I don't know, we'll call it a number. So we have a 16 bit number that we can save. But sometimes we need to save more information, either really large piece of information or a lot of these numbers, perhaps. So we can create a memory array by specifying a depth after this number. And you'll actually note that the indices are reversed. We're going to go from 31 to 0. So this is the depth. It basically tells you how many rows there are, how many rows of 16 bits. So we could have 32 16-bit numbers. So that's great. The FPGA will be able to take this and infer some bits of memory here for us. But what if I needed to save a lot more numbers, like maybe 2048 of them? Okay, now we've got a lot of bits, a lot of memory that this is going to take up. So it can do this. Um, if we if we just leave it this way, the FPGA will figure it out. And what it will do is if we take a look at the internal structure, um, each, each complex logic block has lookup tables and registers in them. And so it will use those and link them together to create RAM for us. And if, it, if the amount of space that we need exceeds what one complex logic block can handle, then it will overflow into the next and the next and the next and the next and the next until we have enough. And this works great. It is really fast for small amounts of data that we need saved. But when you start getting into really large amounts of RAM that we require, it starts to become slow because of all these different connections um, it's not ideal. We also end up chewing through a lot of the resources on the chip and leave ourselves with less to build with. When that happens, we want to take a look at, instead of using distributed RAM, we want to use dedicated block RAM. And you see here that there are some memory blocks in the chip dedicated specifically to serve as RAM. So how do we get the FPGA to know that we want dedicated block RAM instead of to use the distributed RAM? Well, that is a good question, and it's actually very easy. What we need to do is create a new module and create a certain context. It's looking for a, a few specific features, and when it when our editor here sees a certain format, it's going to say, oh, you're talking about block RAM. Okay, let me build that for you. So what we have here are uh, three parameters, an address width, data width, and depth. We'll get to that in a moment. We've got a clock because this is going to be a synchronous block RAM. Um, and input address, whether we're reading or writing to the memory, and then data incoming for saving, and then output data. This is pretty much exactly the same line that we saw over here. The only way that it's different is that it is interpreted differently in the context of a module of this sort of structure. And it's actually going to be inferred into block RAM. So we have 
the data width, this is set by a parameter up here. This would be like if you wanted to save a bunch of 16 bit numbers, then data width would be 16. And then depth is how many rows of that data do you want? In this case, the default is 256. And then address width is how many bits do you need in order to be able to uniquely identify each row? So with 256 depth, we need eight bits of address. And the rest of the logic for this is really simple to make it synchronous. If we're writing data, then at a positive edge of the clock, save the input data into the memory array. And if we're reading, then put the memory array data at that address to the output. So we can come over here then and create an SRAM and then we can specify our stuff like the address width and the other stuff in there. I don't know, we'll call it number array and then you'll put your stuff uh, your clock and everything else. So these two things will do, will behave very similarly, but the difference is this is going to create distributed RAM and this is going to use block RAM. Just because we followed this template uh, in, in a module, it recognizes it as block RAM. One thing you'll probably want to look at if you're building with a lot of memory is make sure that your chip can handle the amount of memory that you're demanding. So in this case, we've got 2048 16-bit numbers. And if we do a simple calculation times 16, that's 32 kilobits or four kilobytes. All right, and I am using the this chip right here, the SLX9. And so I see I've got 576 kilobits. So I indeed have enough block RAM in the chip to be able to handle this. Now, if we actually, if we look at what we're doing here, if I built this using distributed RAM, then it would not be tapping into this block RAM. This is the block RAM you would be taking out of your logic cells if you did distributed RAM. So just keep that in mind. The other thing I want to look at real quick is just the timing diagram for the SRAM. It's, uh, well, here, here's a test bench that I have for it. We just initialize all of the wires that we need. Device under testing is an SRAM. And we're basically enabling, so we're, we're writing data for a bit then we're reading, writing, and then reading. Let's go ahead and run this. Okay. And we wanna be looking at the actual memory array. So let's get some of these in here. Rewind, rerun and zoom fit. Okay, so what we see is when we set write enable to high, then at this address, it saved this data into a memory array at the positive edge of the clock. 
And then we changed the address right here. And so then you see at that positive edge, it saved the data, which also changed into the next memory array. So you can take a closer look at this if you want. Really, it's just a standard synchronous RAM. Um, but this is how it works. And just make sure that as you're writing your circuit that uses SRAM, that you leave some time for the synchronous RAM to take effect and uh, work as, as you're running through your, your uh, synchronous logic. Well, I hope this distinction between the distributed RAM and block RAM has been helpful for you. This should be able to save you a lot of uh, efficiency and maybe some speed as well, but especially with regards to resources and space inside your FPGA. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to leave a comment and I'll get back to you.